In these folders are more than 1,200 pages of transcripts. Maybe, just maybe, if I give them a little bit of it, that that'll be enough. Verifying the authenticity of the tape itself is crucial, and that can only be done by having the president comply with the House Judiciary Committee subpoena in full. President Nixon could be confronted with an adverse decision from the Supreme Court just as the House of Representatives prepares to vote on impeachment. Former Nixon aide Frederick LaRue pleaded guilty of conspiring to obstruct justice. Donald Segretti, the dirty trick specialist, pleaded guilty. John Dean, a key figure in the Watergate case, pleaded guilty today. Jeb Stuart Magruder went to court today to plead guilty to conspiracy charges. For the first time in American history, a former attorney general of the United States, Richard Kleindienst, pleaded guilty today to a crime. Despite a parade of confessions and looming impeachment proceedings, President Richard Nixon continued to fight. But now, Watergate Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski was asking the Supreme Court to force Nixon to surrender 64 tapes for use in prosecuting Nixon's former inner circle. Jaworski, who could have gone in the side, which is the way you really go in, goes up those stairs with a couple of young guys around him, and there are crowds chanting. And I imagine that Jaworski he must have been in tears inside. Well, it says equal justice under law, so we ought to win, Phil. Although filming of Supreme Court arguments is prohibited, an audio recording was made. Nixon's lawyer, James St. Clair, argued that presidential executive privilege was total and absolute, even for evidence of a crime. Let us assume that it had been established that the conversations we're talking about here today did involve a criminal conspiracy. Would you still be asserting an absolute privilege? Yes, quite clearly. What public interest is there in preserving secrecy with respect to a criminal conspiracy? Ostensibly, the prosecutors just wanted the tapes to prosecute Nixon's former aides, but everyone realized that this was also about the potential impeachment of Richard Nixon. How are you going to impeach him if you don't know about it? Well, if you know about it, then you, you can state the case. If you don't know about okay, it, you never right. have it. You know the president's doing something wrong. You can impeach him. But the only way you can find out is this way. You can't impeach him. So you don't impeach him. You lose in some place wrong. Well. And finally, everyone also realized that this wasn't just about Richard Nixon either. It was about something much, much larger. This case really presents one fundamental issue. Who is to be the arbiter of what the Constitution says? Now, the president may be right in how he reads the Constitution, but he may also be wrong. And if he is wrong, who is there to tell him so? And if there is no one, what then becomes of our constitutional form of government? In part because three Supreme Court justices were Nixon appointees, the White House was optimistic. There is a thing called executive privilege, and it is recognized, and it does have standing in law. And I did think that there was a real chance that people would say the innermost conversations of the president in the Oval Office certainly are, are, are immune from uh, the courts. Nixon has seen in his own career Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower make that argument successfully and feels confident it's part of the reason he doesn't destroy the tapes in the first place. Two weeks went by. Then on July 22, with the Supreme Court's decision still unknown, the House Judiciary Committee announced that its debate over impeachment would start in two days, at 8 p.m. on July 24. And for the first time in history, a congressional debate would be televised live. The House of Representatives doesn't easily change its rules and traditions, but today it gave the impeachment inquiry the right to open its debate to television. The very next day, July 23, the Supreme Court suddenly announced it would hold a special session the following morning. Good morning. The Supreme Court has just ruled on the tapes controversy, and here's Carl Stern, who has that ruling. It is a unanimous decision, Doug, 8 to 0. Justice Rehnquist took no part in the decision uh, ordering the President of the United States to turn over the tapes. So it's, an eight, it's an 8 to 0 unanimous opinion that President Nixon must obey the subpoenas issued by Special Watergate Prosecutor Leon Jaworski and turn over 64 disputed White House tapes to Mr. Jaworski. And what we do not know yet is whether or not the President will obey that order. No man is above the law. The Supreme Court unanimously ruled in favor of our right to compel the president to produce this evidence. 
The rest is history. With congressional debate on impeachment starting later the same day, the obvious question was whether Congress would get the tapes too, but Jaworski wouldn't say. Do you expect the House Judiciary Committee to make an application with Judge Sirica for those tapes? I really have not the slightest idea. Would you oppose an application by the House Judiciary Committee for those tapes? As Mr. St. Clair would say, that's not the best. Even after the special prosecutor's victory at the Supreme Court, Nixon continued to defy congressional subpoenas. But pressure was mounting. Unless the president wishes to plead the Fifth Amendment, privilege against self-incrimination, I think as a result of this decision, he should voluntarily turn these tapes over to the House committee. I think the decision goes a long way to vindicate uh, the subpoena issued by the House Judiciary Committee and to establish the proposition that uh, non-compliance with the House subpoena was itself a cause for impeachment. Attorney James St. Clair has let it be known his office has at least researched the possibility of non-compliance. There is, of course, also the option the president will comply with the court's decision. St. Clair has said it could take up to two months to prepare the tape material for Sirica's court. He's standing on the beach in San Clemente, and they tell him that he's lost the Supreme Court decision. And a message goes back to uh, Washington. What would happen if we defy the court? And Al Haig replies, instant, uh, uh, instant impeachment. Just one hour before the impeachment debate was scheduled to begin, James St. Clair announced Nixon's decision. I have reviewed the decision of the Supreme Court with the president. He's given me this statement, which he's asked me to read to you. And this is the president's statement as he gave it to me. While I am, of course, disappointed in the result, I respect and accept the court's decision. And I have instructed Mr. St. Clair to take whatever measures are necessary to comply with that decision in all respects. One hour later, on live national television, Peter Redino opened public debate on the impeachment of Richard Nixon. The committee will come to order. Throughout all of the painstaking proceedings, I, as the chairman, have been guided by a simple principle, the principle that the law must deal fairly with every man. Now the American people and the whole history of our republic demand that we make up our minds. New Secretary Ronald Ziegler indicated to us that the president had no intention of uh, watching the hearings. Uh, note, uh, I suppose we should say, that uh, during the Watergate hearings, we were told much the very same thing at that time, that the president seldom if ever watched them. We learned later in the transcripts that he indeed uh, watched a good deal of them. The debate immediately revealed Elizabeth Holtzman as a new political rock star. Holtzman was the daughter of Eastern European immigrants, a graduate of Harvard Law School, newly elected to Congress, 32 years old. And how many of us have not quarreled with presidents in the past, Democrats or Republicans, over agricultural policy or environmental policy or foreign policy or whatever. Does that give any president the, president the license to burglarize our home, to wiretap our phones, to open our mail? I submit that if it does, we have gone down the long road to tyranny and that the blessings of liberty that we formed this Constitution 200 years ago to preserve will vanish very quickly. And I would like to remind my colleagues that under the Constitution of the United States, we in the House of Representatives, through the power of impeachment, have been given the duty to preserve this Constitution. This committee has heard evidence of governmental corruption unequaled in the history of the United States. The cover-up of crimes, obstructing the prosecution of criminals, tax violations, and personal enrichment at public expense bribery and blackmail, flagrant misuse of the FBI, the CIA, and the IRS. Most Republicans, however, continue to defend Nixon. John Dean did something wrong, in my opinion. And Ehrlichman did something wrong. One of them requested that the CIA provide bail money for these defendants. And they were promptly rebuffed, of course, by the CIA. But that was a wrongful act. There's not a word, not a word, ladies and gentlemen, of presidential knowledge or awareness or involvement in that wrongful act. After two hours, the debate was interrupted by a bomb threat. It's necessary that 
we do recess for a period of time. There has been a bomb threat, and uh, the committee has recessed, and the room is being cleared. I don't know many details except to say that it was a telephone bomb threat. It reached the committee just moments ago. When debate resumed the following day, America discovered another rising star, Barbara Jordan of Texas. The fact is that on yesterday, the American people waited with great anxiety for eight hours, not knowing whether their president would obey an order of the Supreme Court of the United States. Earlier today, we heard the beginning of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We the people. It's a very eloquent beginning. But when that document was completed on the 17th of September in 1787, I was not included in that we the people. I felt somehow for many years that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. But through the process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision, I have finally been included in We the People. Today, I am an inquisitor. And hyperbole would not be fictional and would not overstate the solemnness that I feel right now. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. It isn't the presidency that is in jeopardy from us. We would strive to strengthen and protect the presidency. But if there be no accountability, Another president will feel free to do as he chooses, but, ne but the next time, there may be no watchman in the night. Republicans David Dennis and Trent Lott gave the strongest speeches opposing impeachment. The March 21 payment to Hunt was the last in a long series of such payments, engineered by Mitchell, Haldeman, Dean, and Comback, and later on LaRue, and all so far as appears without the president's knowledge or complicity. We are faced with impeaching the president. The line must be drawn directly to the president, clearly to the president. This has not been done. But they hadn't reckoned with Elizabeth Holtzman. The president discussed the matter of paying Hunt 10 separate times in a conversation on March 21st with Dean and Haldeman. And the last time the president discussed it, he said, and I quote, that's why, for your immediate thing, you've got no choice with Hunt but the 120 or whatever it is, right? Would you agree that that's a buy time thing? You better damn well get that done, but fast. Well, for Christ's sake, get it. Perhaps some people find ambiguities in that conversation. I don't. I became district attorney many years later of Brooklyn, New York, and I had the opportunity to listen to wiretaps of mafiosi and other criminals conspiring. And I remember thinking, this is what I heard in the White House of the United States. And I was very saddened by that. Nowhere in the thousands of pages of evidence presented to this committee does the president ask, what does the Constitution say? What are the limits of my power? What does my oath of office require of me? What is the right thing to do? Meanwhile, even after the Supreme Court decision, the special prosecutors were still fighting for the tapes. Before Judge John Zarecka, Jaworski's soft drawl did not quite mask his anger. I must say, in all candor, that our experience so far has been very poor, very disappointing. Reference to missing tapes, gaps, and buzzes was unmistakable. The president's lawyer tried to argue, James St. Clair saying legal work might delay delivery of the tapes. But Judge Zarecka, brandishing his Supreme Court ruling, interrupted. You're making this thing more complicated than it should be. Sirica sent St. Clair and Jaworski into a side room, treated them to a pot of coffee, and told them to come out with an agreement or he'd impose one. It was a no-lose proposition for Jaworski, who came out with a White House guarantee that he'll have the first tapes by next Tuesday. After three days of debate, and just before the first vote on impeachment, Vice President Ford gave a speech. And it's my judgment that the evidence is overwhelming that he had nothing to do with the so-called cover-up. 
So the president, in my judgment, is innocent and will be exonerated. But even among Republicans, the tide had begun to turn. One of the first was a conservative from Chicago. The only materials which we've received have, been, have come from the grand jury and from the special prosecutor. It seems to me the president's failure to comply threatens the integrity of our impeachment process itself. His action is a direct challenge to the Congress in the exercise of its solemn constitutional duty. What Seal Nixon was doing was when four young Republican congressmen came out and voted for the first article of impeachment. Hamilton Fish of New York. I am a Republican. In these proceedings, I have attempted to discipline myself in partisan neutrality. Caldwell Butler of Virginia. A power appears to have corrupted. It is a sad chapter in American history, but I cannot condone what I have heard. I cannot excuse it, and I cannot and will not stand still for it. Tom Railsback of Illinois. We are considering impeaching a man Richard Nixon, who has been in my district twice campaigning for me, that I regard as a friend. Bill Cohen of Maine. It's been said that an impeachment proceeding will tear this country apart. And to say that it will tear the country apart to abide by the Constitution is a proposition that I cannot accept. I think what would tear the country apart would be to turn our backs on the facts and our responsibilities to ascertain them. That's what put Nixon down, because it had to be bipartisan if the Judiciary Committee was going to impeach. Those votes were symbolically outsized and huge. But had they all been Democratic votes alone, who knows what the outcome might have been. Mr. Butler. Aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Lott. No. Mr. Fraley. Aye. Mr. Moorhead. No. Mr. Marazzini. No. Mr. Lada. No. Mr. Rodino. Aye. 27 members have voted aye. 11 members have voted no. And pursuant to the resolution, Article 1, that resolution is adopted and will be reported to the House. Nixon refused to resign, thought that he would fight this thing in, uh, in the Senate of the United States. He knew he would be impeached by the full House, but that he could prevail in a, in a trial in the Senate uh, where you need uh, two-thirds of the votes of the senators to convict. Congress began preparing for an impeachment vote by the full House of Representatives in a subsequent Senate trial. But then, only a few days later, there was yet another surprise. President Nixon stunned the country today by admitting that he held back evidence from the House Judiciary Committee. The president made public three new transcripts of meetings with his former chief aide, H.R. Bob Haldeman, all June 23, 1972. Now, on the Democratic break-in, we're back to the problem area. Well, now, on the Democratic break-in, uh, we're back in the problem area because the FBI is not under control, because Gray doesn't exactly know how to control them. John Dean concurs now with Mitchell's recommendation that the only way to solve this is to have Walters call Gray and, uh, and just say, stay the hell out of this. You know, we don't want you to go any further on it. And that's not unusual. Right. Fine. And they say the only way to do that is from White House instructions. The proposal would be that Ehrlichman and I Call him. Good. Play it tough. That's the way they play it. That's the way we're going to play it. OK, we'll do that. They should call the FBI in and say that for the country, don't go any further into this one, period. Tell them, lay off. Yeah, that's, that's the basis we do it on. I don't want to get any ideas. We're doing it because our concern is political. They had asked for some tapes. Nixon had called to review them in April. One of them was the tape of June 23rd. He had heard the tape and felt he couldn't survive it. And that's why he didn't turn the tapes over. And we were all called up to Camp David early in August Sunday. And I had felt Nixon couldn't survive. And I said, we don't recommend Nixon resign. But we take this problematic tape and we simply drop it on the public. 
the revelation of the tape will be the thing that convinces Nixon's people, his strong supporters, that they can't even support him any more than he has to resign. The tapes were not turned over to Judge Sirica, but rather immediately released to the public. Why did that happen? When a lawyer feels that his client has caused him to make a misrepresentation to a tribunal, under the lawyer's rules of ethics, that's a serious problem. James St. Clair, the president's lawyer, threatened to resign unless Mr. Nixon released the transcripts and stated that Mr. St. Clair had no knowledge of the untruths in the president's earlier defense. Are you going to quit because the president didn't tell you the whole truth? Interfering with an FBI investigation can be obstruction of justice, a felony. But almost as damaging are other disclosures in that June 23rd conversation revealing a pattern of lies and distortions by Mr. Nixon and his men about Watergate. I knew that the Justice Department and the FBI were conducting intensive investigations as I had insisted that they should. The White House counsel, John Dean, was assigned to monitor these investigations and particularly to check into any possible White House involvement. But the transcripts show that six months before, H.R. Haldeman told the president that Dean was in on the cover-up. It was clear that Nixon had orchestrated the cover-up just about from the minute after the break-in. And so at that point, there was nothing for the Republicans to fall back on. The fact that there have been so many of these bombshells, this is the story, and then this is the story, and then this is the story, and um, I just think that when you add it all up, you know, we've reached the point of no return. And I shall support <clears throat> those portions of Article One of the Bill of Impeachment What I thought I knew about Richard Nixon was this person is not going to resign. He will, in a Texas phrase, fight it till the last dog dies because he will always be able to convince himself, I can win it. And you have the Defense Secretary, James Schlesinger, warning the Joint Chiefs of Staff that any orders, any last minute crazy orders that come out of the White House are gonna be vetted by the civilian leadership and the military before, you know, it's instituted, basically, if the president orders the Marines to come out of the barracks and surround the White House to, you know, and, and announces a coup, you know, don't obey that presidential order. This is bordering on, on treason, but this is this, the point that they were at and the fears that they had. I always said that we would be in trouble if General Haig put on his uniform when he went to work that day. If the president clearly makes the decision to resign. I am not going to feel that it was the wrong decision, but I do feel I am not going to suggest to him that he resign. Perhaps the toughest assessment came from Senator Robert Dole, the former chairman of the Republican Party. Dole said that for Republicans who are trying to get reelected in November as he is, Jerry Ford by Labor Day would ease our workload. The Republicans wanted him out of office. Just look at the timetable. If the impeachment had gone forward, there would have had to have been a House vote. Then there would have to be a trial in the Senate. That would be September, October. In November, there are going to be elections for the House and Senate. If that trial had taken place, an impeachment trial of Nixon, how many Republicans do you think would have been elected to the House and Senate? <laughs> and so congressional Republicans mounted an all-out emergency campaign to persuade Nixon to resign. Senator Scott and Goldwater arrived at the White House first. They were followed a few moments later by House Minority Leader John Rhodes. Barry Goldwater, the great conservative, led a delegation of congressional Republican leaders to the White House to meet with Nixon. And Nixon said, Barry, how many votes do I have in the Senate for acquittal? Fully expecting that Goldwater would tell him X number and growing. Goldwater looked at him and he said, maybe four right now, Mr. President, and you don't have my vote. We uh, had a good, thorough discussion. And I think I speak for my two colleagues when I say that we were extremely impressed. That was a defining moment because he had relied on those in this tight inner circle. And you know, one thing we politicians are very good at is kidding ourselves, particularly as far as our popularity is concerned. We have told him that the situation is very gloomy on Capitol Hill and uh, that it is uh, 
very distressing situation, and we gave him further evaluations, which I think ought to remain uh, uh, between ourselves. But getting Nixon to resign wouldn't be easy, in part because Nixon feared what might come afterwards. It seems inconceivable that he will not resign. He says firmly that he will not. What he may be doing is a kind of plea bargaining. Once he becomes a private citizen, it is easy to see years of $100,000 a month legal fees ahead of him, even if he never went to jail. He hasn't got that kind of money left. If President Nixon resigns, what are the possibilities of his being indicted and facing trial on charges? What do you suppose congressional reaction would be if the president issued a pardon for himself or for any of his assistants faced with jail or prosecution? I just can't, can't imagine that kind of a thing being done by him. Uh, I think he'd leave under uh, a much greater cloud than he is now. During this time, Haldeman and other former Nixon aides desperately begged Nixon for pardons. Nixon refused, but his own resignation now seemed inevitable. All week, uh, people have begun to just sort of gather outside the White House. This uh, applause you hear, what has happened is that a moving van has just pulled up over at the White House. It may just be that the van is going down Pennsylvania Avenue, but at any rate, uh, it pulled up here, and uh, some of the people in this crowd uh, began to, uh, to applaud uh, when it did. I'm aware of the intense interest of the American people and of you in this room concerning developments today and over the last few days. This has, of course, not been a, diff has been a difficult time. The President of the United States will meet various members of the bipartisan leadership of Congress here at the White House early this evening. Tonight at 9 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time, the President of the United States will address the nation on radio and television from his Oval Office. We were in the office that night, and, and I remember Catherine came downstairs and, and she said, no gloating, this was before Nixon went on air to, and, and let me tell you, there was no chance that we were going to gloat, and Woodward and I went off to a little room and watched it by ourselves. What was Watergate? The five wars of Watergate, first against the anti-war movement, then against the news media, the war against the Democrats, the war against justice, and then the war against history. Ollie, no, only the CBS crew now is to be in this room during this. Only the crew. No, there, no, there will be no picture. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected me. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. My feeling, and I think Bob's too, was an absolute awe. Awe that one, the system had worked. Yes, that we had had a part in it, but that this thing was going to end the way it ought to end. And that, uh, you know, awe that it had come to this. The next morning, using his last hour as president to address his cabinet and staff, 
Richard Nixon gave the best speech of his life. This office, great as it is, can only be as great as the men and women who work for and with the president. This house, for example, I was thinking of it as we walked down this hall. This isn't the finest house. Many in Europe, particularly in China, Asia, have paintings of great, great value, things that we just don't have here and probably will never have until we are a thousand years old or older. But this is the best house. It's the best house because it has something far more important than numbers of rooms or how big it is, far more important than numbers of magnificent pieces of art. This house has a great heart. And that heart comes from those who serve. And then Nixon concluded with a recommendation that, as he must have realized, applied to him above all. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Nixon, as he leaves the White House here to board the helicopter for the flight to California. And there's the president waving goodbye. And you hear the applause. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. But Watergate was far from over. One remaining question was whether to put Richard Nixon in jail. After he resigned in August, we said, let's amend the indictment and add him as a defendant. He is now a private citizen. When people commit crimes, they should pay the price. Leon said the publicity would ruin the trial. You couldn't go to trial for a very long time. And we all said, no problem. We all will come back. We'll go on to our other lives, but we will come back to try the case whenever it is appropriate. And Leon said, no. And while we were having this internal argument in the office, the pardon came down. I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon. I heard it on the radio, and I called Woodward. And uh, I woke him up, and I said, you're not going to believe what happened. He said, what happened? I said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. Uh, President Ford did uh, infinite injury to uh, a fun the fundamental uh, principle of good government embodied in the uh, phrase uh, equal justice under law. Members of the original Watergate grand jury are extremely upset by President Ford's decision. Some of them feel their indictments of other Nixon aides are totally unfair if the same justice system is not applied to Nixon. When the top guy has gotten away and is going off to live on the beach in California, how, how zealous do we feel now about, you know, trying to put the people who work for him in jail? I was against it, and so was about 99% of the United States of America. But it was the right decision. The country had spent too much time in Watergate, and the idea of spending another year or two on Richard Nixon wasn't worth it. I've never changed my opinion about that. I think it was wrong from the get-go, and I think it's wrong now. And I think the idea that we have unaccountable presidents has harmed the country. The pardon set up a dual system of justice. The pardon set up a system where the president of the United States was not going to be held accountable under the criminal laws. It also turned out that the pardon was part of a larger deal that eventually gave Nixon control over the tapes. The final deal, as it turned out, was negotiated between Nixon's lawyers and the White House. Not just the arrangements for the pardon, but also the giving of the tapes to Nixon. There were very suspicious things about the pardon. Ford was going to give Nixon all of the White House documents, <laughs> uh, which would have perpetuated a cover-up forever. 
uh, Congress had to undo that. Richard Nixon wasn't done yet, as Benton Becker, the White House official who handled the pardon, soon found out. Within 48 hours after Richard Nixon's plane landed in California, Richard Nixon picked up the telephone and told General Haig, there are almost a thousand boxes in the executive office building. Put those boxes in a, um, uh, a truck and send them to Andrews Air Force Base and send them out here to San Clemente. One afternoon, I noticed uh, a truck packing boxes. When I asked the uh, colonel who was supervising the uh, packing of the boxes, he told me that he had gotten his orders from the chief of staff, uh, Alexander Haig. I reported all of this to the president, and the president brought in Mr. Haig, and Mr. Haig told the president that it was a mistake. He didn't issue that order, and the boxes were not sent. Public anger over the pardon and the tapes deal forced President Ford to meet with the House Judiciary Committee. Most of the committee was deferential, but not Elizabeth Holtzman. There was no deal, period, under no circumstances. Well, Mr. President, I know that the people want to understand how you can explain having pardoned Richard Nixon without specifying any of the crimes for which he was pardoned? And how can you explain pardoning Richard Nixon without obtaining any acknowledgement of guilt from him? How can this extraordinary haste in which the pardon was decided on and the secrecy with which it was carried out be explained? And how can you explain the fact that the pardon of Richard Nixon was accompanied by an agreement with respect to the tapes, which in essence, and the public mind hampered the special prosecutor's access to these materials. Those tapes, according to the attorney general, and I might add, according to past president, precedent, belong to President Nixon. Uh, those tapes are in our control. They are under an agreement which protects them totally, fully. But the original deal only protected the tapes for five years, and popular outrage forced Ford to retreat. Congress quickly passed a bill making the tapes government property, and the vote was so overwhelming that Ford had to sign it. A few months later, when Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Mitchell went to trial, they denied everything. But the special prosecutors played the tapes for the jury, and it worked. Good evening. The men who were closest to Richard Nixon in the White House and in politics Today, we're sentenced to prison for their role in the Watergate cover-up. Mitchell, two and a half to eight years. Haldeman, two and a half to eight years. Ehrlichman, two and a half to eight years. Just a few months later, another piece of Richard Nixon's legacy died too. In April 1975, South Vietnam collapsed, and the communist North Vietnamese marched into Saigon to assume power, catching the United States totally unprepared. The people here were herded into groups, 50 at a time. They took off for the carriers waiting in the South China Sea. The South Vietnamese helicopters came into the U.S. ships. There was no room for them, so the Navy men ordered the pilots to ditch the helicopters in the ocean. Time after time, the pilots hovered over the water and jumped out, praying the helicopters wouldn't fall on top of them. As risky as this was, the pilots decided it was better than flying back to Vietnam. Another half million South Vietnamese fled later, becoming the refugees known as the Boat People. We want water! We want water! In 1976, Jimmy Carter defeated Gerald Ford. On Carter's second day in office, he pardoned over 200,000 Vietnam draft violators. In 1978, Carter signed into law the Ethics in Government Act, which guaranteed the independence of special prosecutors. It was allowed to expire in 1999. 41 people were convicted in relation to Watergate. A few years later, Pete McCloskey went to visit John Ehrlichman in prison. John and I had been friends, our wives had been friends. I flew to Tucson and drove over to the Safford Penitentiary, which is on the desert near Fort Huachuca. There's no fence around it, it's just desert. I said, John, how in hell did this ever happen? You're an honorable lawyer, you're a good father, good Christian scientist. He looked out across the desert at least 30 seconds and he said, Pete, it took us three and a half years to be corrupted by the power of the White House. But we came to believe that the re-election of Nixon was essential to the national security. And I asked him one more question. I said, John, tell me about Nixon. He shook his head and said, I never really got to know him.
presence here is one additional bit of evidence that the American dream need not forever be deferred. Let me hear you. Nobody knows. We were due to go see Butch Cassidy that night in, in Harvard Square. I saw the advance copy of a Sunday New York Times, I think came in around midnight at the Harvard Square kiosk. That was how I learned. I was very happy, very happy. This is a uh, original art from uh, an issue of The Incredible Hulk, detailing the time when June Volper and Ben Vincent rooted out the aliens who were occupying the Oval Office and returned America to peace and prosperity. That's the one thing the Watergate established. The president is not off limits. I was no longer an endangered species, I was an extinct species, a liberal Republican. <laughs> I was at CBS News for 44 years. I do um, hard news investigative reporting and documentaries. That was Kissinger, a lying son of a bitch. Pardon me. Uh, I'm a climate change skeptic. What I call carbon dioxide a pollutant. Isn't that the food of plants and trees that Reagan referred to? So I've both been fired and resigned for the same job. Which do you prefer, sir? Well, it depends on what audience I'm talking to. Woodrow sometimes go straight to it and say, uh, why was your finger in a cookie jar there? And I would never do that. I would say, yeah, you like coconut macaroons. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's just... The Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs worked closely with the Justice Department in my days. You had a role in increasing the criminalization of marijuana possession. Uh, not really. Uh, you know, I, 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 I you know, uh, well, that's another whole other area to get into. It is. All right, cut. All right. All right. Get out of here, you All rascals. Right. <laughs>